this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. To prepare our hearts for worship this morning, would you please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Our Father and our God, we welcome you into our midst today. We are so blessed, Father, to have this time with you. And we thank you once more for bringing us together, either here at the church or at home, where we can worship you by lifting our voices and where we can open our hearts and minds to a deeper and better understanding of your word through today's message from Pastor Mary. God, we have come here this morning not just to be observers or to be entertained, but to join others in worshiping you. We have gathered this day to affirm that no matter who we are or where we live or what our status of life, we are your children. Thank you for loving us and caring for and about us. Open our minds and spirits that we may be aware of your presence in our midst. In this hour, may we reflect on your power and goodness. Seek forgiveness for our failures and wrongdoings. Discern how we should live and renew our commitment to follow you. Then may we go forth to love and serve you by loving and serving one another. We were once many people. We were once lost in our separate journeys, but you, loving Creator, have called us here to unite us in your spirit. Help us to extend a caring heart to our families and friends and give us the wisdom and strength to share their burdens. You are our protector, deliverer, shield, and strength. We give you thanks and praise as we journey together in the name of Jesus. And Father, as we do whenever we gather, we offer thanks and praise to those who support our church and its outreach into the community. We thank them for the gifts they bring in your blessed name to help us bring the love of your son Jesus out into a hurting and needing world. And all God's people came together and said, Amen. And now would you please stand as you are able and remain standing for our opening song. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Are you tired, weak, and worn? I think a lot of us are at this time. Uh, but we just said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So that's telling us that the Lord made this day, but he made this day for each and every one of us differently. And so if we are going to uh, believe that, then we are going to let him take this day, and we're going to let him lead us in this day. We're not going to take this day away from him and say, okay, you made this day, Lord, but let me show you how it's going to go. We don't do that. We, we let the Lord do that. So I have this little thing going with God. Uh, about a month ago, I was praying, and, you know, I was praying for a lot of different things, and he told me, he said, look, he goes, um, why don't we do this? Why don't you give me all of that? Give me all the things that you're praying about, all the worries that you have, and why don't you today just be joyful? That's your job today. Just be joyful, filled with joy. See joy in everything that happens today. And the other things let me handle, because I will do that for you. How did that go for me? Well, there were times during the day that I wanted to take that away. I wanted to say, okay, you know, uh, this is really, and he would just tap me on the shoulder and say, wait a minute, you're joy today. I'm taking these today. So my, my, my thing is, don't let Satan do this to you. Don't let Satan rob you of the joy that God wants you to have. Let him deal with it. He knows the plan. He knows what's going to happen in all of this. We don't. He does. So let him deal with it, and let's get on with the joy that he wants us to have. And let's show that to the world because we need to bring other people along with us in this time. So let's do that. So I've got a challenge for you right now. This whole hour here, nothing's going to happen in this hour that uh, is going to be bad or anything like that. So what we need to do is give this hour to God. We're here to worship him. We're not here to worry. Worry is of the devil, and faith and hope and worship is of God. So let's do that. So precious Lord, take our hands and lead us on. And let's sing together. <laughs>
standing and sing out with your heart we're going to sing one thing remains and god never gives up on us and he never fails us and we're going to sing it out Stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the chains, this one thing remains, this one thing remains, your love never fails and never gives up. to see you here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this time, Lord. It's all good. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus, that David wasn't sitting in that. Let's just bow our hearts before the Lord. Amen. His love is never ending. Think about it. Think about what he has offered to us and what can live and move within us. 
join our hearts. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time to praise you, to exalt you, to lift you high with the words, the words of our mouths, the, the, the meditations of our heart. It's to glorify you, Lord, to lift you up and to exalt you above the things that are happening uh, in this world, in this natural realm. There's so much there, Lord, and we do need to give that to you. So we just come and we just ask for you to, to take those things that we can't control and that to help us to grab a hold of the things that you make available every single day for our lives. You sustain us with that righteousness that only you can give and those right thoughts and right attitudes. You, you bring all of that that bring about right behaviors. It's just, you're, you have given us such an amazing gift in Christ Jesus. We thank you for Jesus. We just thank you today and just praise you for Jesus and the Savior. We thank you for bringing that salvation to our hearts, for wooing us, pursuing us, and helping Lord Jesus us all along the way of redemption. We just pray, Father, for uh, you know those who haven't invited Jesus into their lives, that they would do that today, that they would just simply say the name of Jesus and say, Lord, come into my heart. It is really that simple because then the Lord brings us into that place where we ask for forgiveness of sins and we receive his righteousness and then we begin that journey to live life with him. So Father, just thank you for making a way for salvation. And we do pray that, that even one person would turn to you today but we're praying for oh so many. We want to know the truth, Lord, the truth about your love, the truth about your plan for us, and we are pressing in today to learn a greater measure of that because every time we open your word, you're teaching us something valuable about life. We are learning life lessons every time we will open that word up and bring it to our hearts and into our understanding. And you bring revelation when we do that. So we're praying for a spirit of revelation today. And we're praying for a word of truth uh, to be exalted in our lives. And we know that that means we have to confess our great need for you. So right now, we confess our great need for you. And we just thank you for always being there and bringing that never failing, never ending love. Thank you, Father. During our service here, Lord, we're going to take a few minutes. I mean, we have loved ones that we want to lift up to you. So in this moment, as we listen to this beautiful music, we just pray for those uh, in our lives that need a touch. Some of them need physical healing. Some of them need emotional healing. And all of us need the spiritual healing that you alone bring every day. So thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for being with us and loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so last week, we looked at the life of Jacob, and we looked at the work of the Lord to bring redemption to him, as well as to bring redemption to the broken relationship that Jacob had with his brother Esau. All of that happened due to sin. You know that sin causes all kinds of issues, and so uh, due to sin, there was all kinds of healing that was necessary that uh, God wanted to bring, and Jacob wrestled with God. He wrestled with his flesh, and Scripture says he prevailed. He was given a new name, the name Israel, and that name Israel basically means to cling to God or overcoming with God would be another way to look at that. And also, um, God gave an invitation to Israel uh, to live in the promise and the provision that he would alone provide. But, of course, just like each one of us, Israel had to leave his old way of thinking and living and to embrace 
the new that was uh, before him. Let's review just a little bit about redemption before we go into our story for today. Now, the redemption is the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, and evil. But it is also the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing up a debt. Now, the Lord's always going to bring us into wholeness of redemption uh, by bringing a divine dimension of his presence to our lives. <clears throat> he is basically our divine possession. And we must exchange our old sinful nature for his righteousness, and we do that through a process. Somebody say process. process. It's a process, and we have to make the journey, and God invites us in, and he says, hey, I'm going to invite you into this journey, but not only am I inviting you into the journey, I'm going to make the journey with you. So come to, into the process. As followers of Christ, we are called to go. We're called to be examples of that work of redemption. And a lot of times where God allows us to go in our sinful nature, and we drag that along much of the time, and God says, I'm going to have you stop here, and I'm going to help you deal with these things, and then we just keep going. It doesn't matter uh, what we think about the situation. There's always somebody watching the process. There's always someone that is a witness to the change in our lives for righteousness. And God has made us to be examples. Somebody say, I'm an example. There's that personal responsibility. And God places us in there. And he wants us to be examples of that work of redemption and to be witnessing to it all the time. Not only with our actions, but with our words. Because of sin and rebellion against God and his work of redemption, uh, the need to ask for forgiveness as well as extend forgiveness to others is always going to be a spiritual principle. And it's going to be a theme that we see run throughout Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the need for forgiveness. And um, those that call out to the Lord to be saved, uh, our sins are forgiven. And then once we have been forgiven of that mighty uh, work of God, the, the forgiveness of our own sins, then we turn and we are forgiving to other people. And we understand that as long as the world remains before Christ comes again, sin is going to be present in the world and we're going to need to practice forgiveness and exercise that beautiful thing that we alone have been given that we're going to need to pass on to other people because that's the spirit of Christ. Forgiveness is a kingdom principle. It's got to be uh, exercise to produce fruit, and that fruit is abundant living. I mean, when we produce the fruit of the Lord and the fruit of the Spirit of Christ, it is abundant living that we step into, and that's what Jesus said. He promised. He said, the thief comes to rob, steal, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it in abundance, and it means the fruit of the Spirit will be operating in our lives, and it is a place of abundance. <clears throat> we have this divine dimension, so don't forget that. Uh, he is holy, and he lives and moves and has his being within us, and we cooperate in that whole process. And because of this gift, it's a beautiful one too, by the way, um, Satan is ever-present to tempt us to operate in a different spirit. So if I said to you the spirit of Christ is forgiveness, what would be the spirit of Antichrist? Unforgiveness, wouldn't it? A spirit of unforgiveness is a spirit of Antichrist. If you and I are going to stand in that place with the Lord, we're going to have to get in agreement with him. When we do not get into agreement with the word and his teachings and what he shows us about the fruit of righteousness and we aren't willing to go in then, then we still want to claim Christ, but Christ says, I never knew you because you didn't let me, somebody get this morning, you didn't let me do the work in you that I want to do. I so want to do that. The Lord wants to bring all of that righteousness to our hearts. He wants to be able to tap us on the shoulder, as Corpse Dog, and say, no, wait just a minute, right? This is what I'm asking of you. And by the way, joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So we have to be in that place. Now, um, hit, Satan's goal is to rob you of the blessing of God, and you need to understand that. And you need to be mad when you feel like, you know, he is trying to do that. You need to have a holy um, and a righteous anger against anything that would rob you from having all that Jesus died to give you. And you have to take a stand against it. So today I want you to mentally park 
um, on that theme about human beings and the work of redemption and forgiveness as we look at two behavioral choices uh, revealed in our scripture passage that hinder spiritual growth and progress of believers as well as isolate, deceive, and destroy non-believers. The first one, choosing to keep score. It's an idiom. We all know what it means, right? You did this, and so I'm going to do that. Now we're even, right? Choosing to keep score. Did anybody ever keep score in your family? Come on, be real, be honest. Uh huh. I remember sitting back thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, that wasn't fair, right? Nobody thinks that way, though, do they? Yeah. Wait a minute, you did this for that one over there. What about me over here? It's keeping score. It's keeping score. It's sitting back and saying, you know, like, I, I should have. You didn't, and uh, therefore I'm mad. I should have received this. And we sit back, and a lot of times we're not even aware of how real that spirit is that tries to get on us, right? Even as believers. Even as believers. Unbelievers can sit back because they don't have the spirit of Christ in them going like, oh, wait, no, no. But as believers, we have the spirit of Christ going like, wait just a minute. Either you believe that I am going to be good to you or you don't. If you're going to keep score in the natural, then you're going to hinder me from doing in the supernatural what I really want to do in your life. Which one do you want, right? Come on. Some choices. Somebody say, I have a choice. (laughs) Basically, when we look at choosing to keep score, we're twisting the principle of sowing and reaping. We're just twisting it. We're saying, you know what? I, you didn't provide for me, Lord, so I'm going to take it upon myself to reward myself. I'm going to get mad at so-and-so. I'm going to take issue with such and such, and therefore, I'm going to take care of it. And it's a twisting, and and God is not in that. You do realize that. The second thing um, is choosing the lesser of two evils. Choosing the lesser of two evils. That basically means when you're presented with two immoral um, options, you choose that which is the least immoral. When you have neither option that seems good, you're going to pick one of those anyway. Well, I got news for you. You will be presented things all through your life, and maybe neither one of them are good. And the reason that God brings you to that place is that you will choose what he wants you to do, which is good, and it's option number three. Okay? It is option number three. He has a plan and a purpose. It's redemption. You and I can't fathom it. We can't even describe it. We'll never look at it the way that God looks at it because his ways are not our ways and our thoughts are not his thoughts. And so we have to know that there's always going to be something else that God's trying to get to us and we have to be willing to go. Somebody say, I will go. All righty. So Joseph, um, he understands all of what's going on here and the brothers are going to understand because we're going to look at Joseph and his siblings Um, and how there was this twisting of the sowing and reaping and twisting of uh, righteousness. And we're going to see where it gets everybody over the next two weeks. We'll actually separate this into two teachings about Joseph. Now, the name Joseph, it means increaser. It basically means he will add. And God's going to add to the divine dimension uh, in our lives as he does in Joseph's if we are willing to go where he wants us to go. I'd like to read from Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4, and verses 12 through 28. Joseph, the dreamer. Jacob lived in the land of Canaan, where his father had, um, had lived. This is his family history. In other words, these are the generations of Jacob learning to live as, and remember, Jacob is learning to live as Israel right now. He's got to make some changes. Can't go back to the way it was. He's going forward himself. And Joseph is his son. Joseph was a young man, 17 years old. He and his brothers, the son of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, cared for the flocks. Joseph was a helper. He was an assistant to his brothers. And Joseph gave his father bad reports about his brothers. 
since Joseph was born when his father Israel um, was old, Israel loved him more than the other sons. He made Joseph a special robe with long sleeves. Uh, basically, um, everyone received uh, a coat, but it was sleeveless. If your coat had sleeves, it was really, and especially if it was long sleeves, it was really seen as a more royal position, a royal robe, if you will. And Joseph's uh, robe that his father made for him had long sleeves, so therefore um, it showed favor. And here's the other thing. Not only did it demonstrate the favor, it actually marked Joseph for the greatest portion of inheritance. And you'd have to read the lessons leading up to this one in um, Genesis uh, 37. You want to read up to that point because you're going to see why it is that um, Israel would give the greatest portion of his inheritance to his son Joseph. has a lot to do with the behaviors of the older brothers. Joseph... His brothers saw their father's favor, okay? Well, they were aware that their father loved Joseph more than, they, than he loved them, and they hated their brother. They couldn't speak to him politely or subtly. And in the midst of all of this, Joseph receives two dreams from Almighty God that goes along with what his father's already put into place, and that is he receives the favor of God, and he begins to be aware that there's something different happening in him. He has a divine um, uh, dimension of himself that he has never seen before, didn't understand, but at the age of 17, it's starting to come out. And Joseph is going to have two dreams. In the first dream, he's in the field with his brothers, and he is gathering, um, they are all gathering bundles of grain, and they're uh, strapping them together. And in, in his dream, Joseph says to, not only he's in his dream, but he also tells his brothers about this dream, that his, his sheaves raise up, and as that happens, their sheaves bow down. Now, the brothers don't care for that dream at all. Then Joseph says he has a second dream. He has a second dream. In the second dream, and he tells his brothers as well as his father's, his father, and he says, in the second dream, I'm standing there and the sun, moon, and 11 stars bow down to me. And the dream ends. Two dreams. Now, if you heard somebody give something like that as far as a, I had this dream, you would probably sit back and go like, you are full of yourself, right? Who are you? Who are you to think I'm going to bow down to you? But keep in mind that God's ways are not our ways. He prepares us for all things. And in these two dreams, this really is less about what anybody else thinks and what God is going to do to bring redemption. He has a plan, and he is going to bring redemption, not only to Joseph, but to the entire household of Israel, and it will be something will sustain and provide for the people as a whole. Joseph really is only communicating what God has put in his heart. But can I tell you that if you're not around the right people, instead of celebrating you, they will try to kill you because people don't like the authority of Almighty God. So let's listen on. We're going to skip a few verses. We're going to come down to verse 12. One day, Joseph's brothers go out to Shechem, to graze their father's flock. Israel says to Joseph, go to Shechem, where your brothers are grazing the flocks. Now keep in mind that Shechem, basically, if you look at Genesis 34, you'll see that the brothers were there. They looted, they burned, they murdered, and they took revenge for their sister's um, rape because she was raped in Shechem. But they took things and matters into their own hands, 
And they went back to that place. Now, Israel is afraid for his sons because he knows what happened in Shechem. And he, they've gone there to graze the flock. And so he is concerned. And so he decides, I'm going to send Joseph to check on them. Let's look at that. Father says, go and see if your brothers and the flocks are all right, and then come back and give me a report. So Joseph's father sent him from the valley of Hebron, where Joseph came, and when Joseph came to Shechem, oh wait, I missed, I missed something very important. So Joseph answers, I will go. <laughs> I will go. And that place of Shechem, basically, um, you know, he's going to head that direction. And he says, I'm going to go, and I will go to the place of responsibility, and I will be purified for God. That is the definition of, of Shechem. Verse 14. His father said, go and see if your brothers and flocks are all right. Then come back and tell me g- and give me a report. So your, Joseph's father went with him from the valley of Hebron, and when Joseph came to Shechem, he found a man um, Wander, he, a man found him wandering in the field and asked him, what are you looking for? And Joseph answered, I am looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where the, they are grazing the flock? And the man said, they have already gone. I heard them say they were going to Dothan, a small time town about 13 miles uh, north, a town uh, referred to as Two Wells. <coughs> Dothan means two wells. Somebody say, there's the two. So some choices are coming. So Joseph went, and he looked for his brothers, and he found them in Dothan. Joseph is sold into slavery. Joseph's brothers saw him coming from afar, and before he reached them, they made a plan to kill him. Now keep in mind the Lord, Lord's hand is on Joseph. And he's going to use him as an example. Verse 19. They said to each other, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw his body into one of these wells. We can tell our father that a wild animal killed and ate him. And then we can see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, the oldest among the brothers, heard the plan and decided he was going to save and rescue him, Joseph, from their hands. So he said, let's not kill him. Let's not take his life. Don't spill any blood here. Just throw him into this well in the desert, but don't hurt him. Don't raise your hand against him. Reuben planned to save Joseph later and send him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they pulled off his robe with the long sleeves, and they threw him in the well, which was empty at the time. Um, And while Joseph was in the well, the brothers sat down to eat. And when they looked up and lifted their eyes up, they saw a group of Ishmaelite travelers from Gilead to Egypt. Their camels were carrying spices, balm, and myrrh. Then Judah, one of the brothers, said to his other brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and hide his death, cover up his blood? Let's sell him to these Ishmaelites, and then we'll not be guilty of killing our own brother. Somebody say it's twisted. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. Doesn't that sound like a noble way to handle things? No. But it is God's plan. (coughs) He's going to use it. Um, So when the Midianites, uh, all the brothers agreed. So when the Midianite traders came by, the brothers took Joseph out. And they sold him to the Ishmaelites for eight ounces or 20 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave. And the Ishmaelites took him to Egypt. So next week, we're going to pick up a little bit of that story. But for now, let's park in this place, okay? So keeping score. In keeping score, the brothers could not. They could not. Now keep in mind, these are all men who have been taught about the faithfulness of God. They saw it in the life of Abraham. They saw it in the life of, of Isaac, and they, or, or they heard about it. And then they saw it in the life of their father, who had turned from being a trickster and headed towards the righteousness of Almighty God. So it's not like these uh, sons that are living in this rebellious place hadn't heard the truth. 
but they had no idea how to bring it into their lives. Much of the time, we can read the Word of God, we can listen to the Word of God, we can uh, reach out and watch other people, but we have sometimes a really rough time thinking about that dimension that God wants to bring to our lives. He, we struggle. We struggle. So, and think about where Jacob was. We, like Jacob, we struggle with that. But we have to accept the fact that God wants to bring change to our lives. And he's going to do that if we are willing to go. And the brothers were not willing to go. In fact, they went into, she into Shechem and caused destruction to the entire area and killed people, and innocent people. They did all kinds of things, and they decided that that was going to make things right. Well, can I tell you that only God can make things right in your life? You're going to suffer. You're going to, people will sin against you, and you will face the, the results and consequences of your own sin. We all are going to find ourselves there. But that is the beauty of God's forgiveness. And in light of that, these boys, Israel's older sons, could not practice that forgiveness. They didn't trust that God would take care of things in his own time, that he would vindicate the wrongs because they knew that they were blessed to be a blessing, and instead they headed in to take vengeance and take things into their own matters. We need to understand the power of God to bring that vindication and to bring truth and righteousness when things go wrong. I pray for that right now. Do you pray for that right now? When I think about our country, I sit back and I'm like, God, only you can right the wrongs. But right now, don't we see people wanting to point out everything that has been done to them or to somebody else and, or to uh, decades by, behind to, to try to rectify that? Can I tell you that only Jesus can bring that forgiveness and, and to bring that deliverance to our hearts because we could all sit back and point to things in our lives that were not fair if we were determined to keep score. Are you determined at all to keep score? Are you inclined to keep score? Because it will rob you every single time. You can't look at a situation and say, this is fair, this is not fair. In the world, it's never going to be fair. Because e e although God is good, Satan is after the devotion that people tend to make towards God. We can't be looking at that situation and go like, well, I have to make things right for myself because this, this was wrong. That doesn't mean we don't speak truth to the situation, but there's a big difference between speaking truth to a situation and taking action to harm somebody, isn't there? And we can't do that. All we will really do is destroy ourselves and our communion with Almighty God. We can't keep score. As far as evil for evil, we can sit back all the time and think that, you know, that uh, that, that whole situation of having, um, you know, two evil choices and there's only, you're going to have to choose between those two, that's a fallacy. There is absolutely no truth in it. God says that his word always makes a way out. He always has, shows us a way of escape when the enemy comes and says, well, you only have two choices. That's a lie. You have another choice. You can call on Almighty God and look for a righteous way to handle something. We have to choose integrity. And one of the things we're going to notice about Joseph is that he chooses integrity. Now, you could sit back and go like, oh, he, but he chose arrogance. But no, he chose to share his dream with people who were supposed to be in line with God and excited about his future, right? And excited about their future. But instead, when he shared what God put in his dreams and he shared it verbally, they hated him for it. They hated him and sought to kill him. If they can kill Joseph, they can stop the dream. Well, God has another plan, and we're going to look forward to that. So when we choose um, <clears throat> to follow integrity and and we're going to grab a hold of that other choice. 
We're not going to keep score. We're not going to choose between two evils. We're going to choose righteousness, and we're going to stand in that place of integrity. When we're willing to do that, then we are going to make evil even more angry. Because that's when God uses us the most as an example. So when you're aware that Satan's coming against you through a loved one, a friend, or whomever because of your integrity that you're determined to stand in, pay close attention. Pay close attention because God's up to something big. He's going to use you as an example, and he's going to use that righteousness that you're willing to step into. Joseph is imparted, we're going to see this, he's imparted special knowledge, ability. He's given an abundance of grace and favor. He is going to fulfill God's plan, but it starts off for him being treated very, very badly by people that should have celebrated him and loved him. He's got to choose not to keep score. He's got to choose uh, to look for the truth, and he cannot give power to evil, and it's a long journey for him, and we're going to look at that. There's always a righteous choice because when it comes to evil, God is never silent. And we need to choose that righteousness. We need to be willing to break any chain of bondage that holds us back that's going to take us from possessing the promises of God. Sometimes God takes us in places where we have just no idea what he has that he wants to do in our life. And I have been there so many times now that it really doesn't surprise me, to be quite honest with you. And each time I have to decide, how, how will Mary respond? When God says, Mary, I want you to go here and I want you to do or share this or that, am I every time, I can tell you, I don't always feel like doing that. But as I have been willing to do that, he has brought victory to me in a many, many ways. Now, I may not have known what he wanted to break off from me during each one of those times, but most of the time I will tell you this. It's probably more than anything in my life, Ben, that he wanted to break fear off from me or that might be even the fear of the whatever it is I was going to do or the fear of failure. Anybody in here ever have the fear of failure? Never want to fail, do we? We never want to feel like we have failed at anything, so therefore we don't do anything. And God says, wait, I'm calling you out of your comfort zone all the time. I want to deliver you from this, this that's hindering you. You're just going to let somebody push you in a pit and you're not going anywhere? Let me take you back out of that and make the journey with you and I will deliver you. God is always going to deliver us. A few weeks ago, I told you about the fact that God had said to me, he said, Mary, I'm going to take you in a totally uh, unnatural direction from you, right? I'm going to ask you to do something and you, I need you to go. Do you remember what it was? It was a motorcycle class. It was a motorcycle class. And I stood before you and I said, I, have, I was scared to death to do that. Why would God take Pastor Mary, five foot two Pastor Mary, put her on a 500 pound motorcycle and say, go girl. <laughs> and I failed the evaluation. And I came home and I was like, God, you know, I could have sworn you asked me to go. And he goes, I did. God, you know, like I conquered my fear. No, no, not yet. Right? <laughs> not quite. But you will. But you will. And I shared that from my heart because I sat back and I thought, you know what, Lord, people do not understand when you give us assignments they have already stereotyped what kind of assignments it's going to be and how it's going to work, and they're going to be real quick to say, oh, no, it, that is not from God, right? Don't we do that? You do it in your life, and you do it in the lives of other people, and if you do not accept that word, then you are deceived. We all do it. It's how the enemy works, and he holds us back all the time. Because it doesn't make sense in the natural. Well, only God wants to, you know, he knows what he wants to do in the supernatural realm. So 
I have learned over the years, and I've loved Jesus since I was five, so I've had some, some experience with him, okay? And so as I'm going, it always seems to be that he picks something in the natural to bring a spiritual deliverance to me, and I have to go through it. And so as I sat there two weeks ago and I just went like, God, what in the world is going on? I don't understand. I get a phone call from the Harley Davidson place and a friend, uh, Sam and I know, and Josephine says, Mary, Pastor Mary, actually is what she said, I'm calling you because you need to get back on the horse. I'm calling you because you should not give up. Don't give up, Pastor Mary. I think you're supposed to do this. I said, I do too. I know. Well, you ready? (laughs) I'm telling you what, I have never been so proud of anything in my whole life, right? Because I was so frightened. And I said, Lord, talk to me about that. And he said, Mary, fear becomes a beast in your life. And you have to confront it. You have to take authority over it. And there is a choice that you have to whether or not to let me deliver you or you just avoid the thing altogether. You can keep pushing it back, or you can go, I will go, I will go, and I'll trust what you want to do, and I'll let you lead my life, and whether or not I even understand it, I'm going to follow, right? Or I can sit back and go like, I don't want any part of this, this doesn't make any sense, and I'm not doing it. If I would have done that and stopped two weeks ago, I would not have the joy I have right now. I would not have the peace I have right now. I had to make the journey. I had to go. Now, it doesn't matter that I would rather have God just said, Mary, I'm just going to impart to you some peace. I'm going to take that fear. Bing, done. I'd like that, but it didn't work that way. He said, confront it. Confront your fear and take authority over it, and you will have victory. Well, God's probably not going to take you to ride a Harley. But the reason God took me to is that my brother almost died on one. And so, therefore, I was frightened inside. I would be frightened when my husband rides one. And so I would be frightened and worried instead of just giving it to God. And, 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 I, and I didn't understand so much about what my own feelings. Come on. But he has a way of delivering us, doesn't he? He does. He does. And afterwards, I sat back and I said, well, I understand more of what's involved in writing one. I understand that um, there's a huge responsibility when one rides one, right? And I'm going to be a better passenger. I don't think I'm going to go buy one. (laughs) John might, yeah. But I'm going to believe that God is going to use this for my good, right? Because on my checklist, do you know this was never on my checklist? Mary wants, this is not my bucket list. It's not. It has nothing to do with it. It doesn't even have a spot. There's nothing there. I would never choose it. But God chose it for me. Do you think that, that Joseph chose to be thrown in the pit And treat it as a slave? No. You say, well, Pastor Mary, that's really a different example. No, it isn't. Because you never know what fear and and the work of evil will bring against you and how God wants to use it to deliver you. And people are watching. And when I walked in there the next time into the Harley Davidson place, they were celebrating with me. Come on. Right? And And this is what I said to them. I talk to people every week about conquering their fears, and then God said I could no longer talk to them about it unless I was willing to do it. So there you go. 
So let's pray for you, huh? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. And we thank you, Father. We actually praise you that your ways are not our ways. The enemy would have never seen me coming this direction. So you use things for our good. And we just thank you, Father, that you make a plan to bring us into the divine possession. You. We get you. And we have this opportunity to let you develop our dimension, that divine dimension. You bring the growth. You bring the favor. You bring the victory. We can be overcomers, but we have to dip from the right well. We can't be going into this area that the enemy wants us to, you know, follow him into. We lead by example by following you. So we just pray for our hearts today. And Father, much of the time, if we look at our lives, we would think, oh, we're not really bothered by scorekeeping. We're really not bothered by, uh, you know, choosing between the lesser of two evils. But we are. And every day, the enemy throws that out there. And if it's not going on in our life, it's going on in somebody's life that we witness. And so we just pray, Father, for our hearts. Protect our hearts. We bring our devotion to you this morning. And we just pray for you to take our hand and guide us through all of these things that we need to go through in order to find ourselves as overcomers on the other side of what fear tried to stop us from gaining. We want to lay hold of your promises, Lord. And in between where the dreams are, where the word comes, when you call us out, and where the overcoming is, there's a big stretch of time there and, and experiences. And so we just pray for our heart to be willing to go with you. And whatever you want us to do, Lord, however you want us to face our fears or our doubts or our insecurities, whatever it is that the enemy's trying to use against us, we pray, Father, that you will help us to gain authority over those things in the name of Jesus and that we will be victorious overcomers because your love never stops. Your love is faithful and you take us through all kinds of things in life and you make us stronger and more determined to live it out in your glory and for your glory. So we pray, Father, for a touch today. I pray for everyone hearing the sound of my voice. I pray everyone would have a touch of your love, your strength, and a determination that they will go wherever it is that you want to take them. It's a spiritual journey that oftentimes is, uh, starts in the natural. So we want to find that possession, Lord, and we need to follow, 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 and be willing to go wherever you go. So be with us. Give us that holy desire. We love you, Lord. And we are looking for ways to serve you in a greater capacity every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing our closing song. Because God is on our side, right, guys? Time to get your groove on here. Here we go. We're going to join us. We're going to come on.
can be against us, but God is on our side. We won't be afraid, though the mountains may fall and the sky will crumble. There ain't nothing gonna stand in our way. Everyone around the world hear the joyful sound. See the heavens open up. friends and here it is it's a journey about your character so stay in that place with him let him forge that character in you and you'll have no idea where God's going to take you in the days to come all right let him prepare you is it's all about preparation are you ready for the journey say I will go there you go love you all blessings <laughs>